How do you design a community to wire it for contribution and activity and interest? Um, how do you build storytelling into your community? Well, we're going to talk about this and many more things today with my guest, Lais de Olivieri, uh, on today's episode of Talk About Your Community. Kalisa, let's roll the opening. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you may happen to be. Uh, you have tuned in to talk about your community, a live stream about community building for community builders and anybody that is uh, interested in understanding how these spaces work online, offline, and importantly, in between. I'm Todd Nilsson, the founder of Clock Tower Advisors, and um, I love having a variety of great guests on this show to talk about the, the amazing work that they're doing. And, um, and today is no exception. In fact, I'm I've been excited and uh, I think she's been overdue uh, to be a guest here on the show. Uh, Laise de Olivieri uh, wrote uh, Hacking Communities, uh, which is an amazing, insightful book. Um, one which I particularly enjoy because of the very personal insights that she offers um, in her stories and, uh, and illustrations, uh, as well as many of the, the metaphors and, and things that she uses to help people think about the importance of community, identity, connectedness, and, uh, and, and other related concepts. So um, we're gonna get to her in just a second. Before we take off into that conversation, just a, a little bit of bookkeeping. Um, I know that we've got uh, CMX coming up. Uh, if you're gonna be uh, uh, tuning in uh, to CMX, if you're gonna be going to CMX, would love to hear from you in the chat about how that's going. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to go, but I'm very interested in knowing how uh, you guys like the, like the, uh, the event uh, when, whenever you go. So would love to hear some feedback on that. I know last year, uh, my friends uh, Ilker uh, Consul and uh, and the wonderful Jenny Wiggle um, came on and we did a bit of a recap after uh, after the CMX event. Maybe I can encourage them to do a special episode uh, uh, around that. If you guys are out there, would love to, to get your take on it. In fact, we can make it a big old party if, uh, if others of you would like to be on the show. I think I can host as many as uh, 10 people in the um, in the streamyard uh, live stream here, uh, so we could actually make it a nice big free for all for everybody. If you if you'd like to, to tune in on that, let me know if that's of interest to you. This is a live and interactive show, so if you are here on the live stream, first of all, welcome. If you haven't been here before, love to have you here. Um, please always jump in with your comments and your ideas and your questions uh, for uh, for me and for our, our guests. Um, and uh, we, we always try to get to everybody in the show. And then if you catch this during the, uh, the replay, um, we definitely keep track of who is replying there and try to get back to every single person as well. So um, without further ado, uh, my guest today is Laís de la Alvieri, uh, who is the author of Hacking Communities. Um, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bring her on here uh, right now. Um, Laís, welcome. It's so good to see you. Hello. Likewise, thank you for having me, Todd. So, really excited I, to nerd around community with you today. <laughs> I, I love that. Any chance to to nerd around with the idea of community uh, with, uh, with with someone as accomplished and uh, and successful as you, uh, I, I absolutely welcome it. Um, so, Laisa, uh, uh, your your work with uh, with with community building, uh, I'm I'm sure uh, there are probably some people out there who are going to be curious to know. Um, you know, how you ended up becoming a community builder. Was there a, was there a, a moment when the light turned on and you realized that community building, being a community professional was the world in which you wanted to live, in which you wanted to mm -hmm. spend a significant chunk of your life? Yeah, um, I guess it was in 2014 that someone I was I had just moved to Malaysia and I started doing the thing that I had been doing for the past specifically two years for the startup ecosystem. But pretty much since 2007, if I look further into the type of work I had been doing, I had been working for a nonprofit, managing uh, 2000 volunteers in like across three countries in, in the southern home, like Argentina, Chile and Uruguay. Uh, and pretty much using techniques that later I would find were part of this compound of knowledge that we today call community building. Back then I had no idea. 
But anyways, back to the point, 2014, I uh, had moved to Malaysia, was hosting meetups for startups, was hosting dinners, was hosting all type of activities to connect founders locally with VCs outside of Malaysia and attract capital to Malaysia and connect people to people and like find mentors to new founders and stuff like that. And then six months in, someone from the Malaysian government invites me for lunch. And it was all very fancy for my taste that I had never been through something like that. And I was like, in this lunch with these people, they're showing me around their facilities, their digital city and stuff, and their tech startup ecosystem initiatives. And they were telling me, we need more community builders like you. And uh, it was my first time hearing that term. And I just remember like, like being taken aback, but my like, sure, yeah, community building, that's what I do, of course, I'm a community builder. And taking them completely seriously um, and pretending I knew what that, what that was. And from then on, I understood that what I was doing was community building and I started using it as a term and I haven't left it since. I think fantastic. Um, ho hopefully I'm, oh, hopefully I'm still coming through here. I think I, I've got a bit of a glitch going on. You got a little glitch. Your fro your screen is frozen, but at least you have a nice face on. So <laughs> like, don't worry about it. <laughs> you're, you're not but, stuck uh, in an awkward That position. would be unusual. Like, then I, I usually catch the most awkward position possible. So, <laughs> um, no, anyways, it looked like well, a very well, thank nice you for skill. that. Oh, very good, very good. Um, well, I'd like to say that was on purpose, but uh, but it was not. Um, so uh, now I I saw something from uh, an interview that you did about the book uh, a couple of years ago, um, where you were kind of describing a little bit of uh, sort of a spiritual journey for yourself uh, with, mm. with community. And I think you had said that you were even kind of considering taking on orders at, at some point, um, mm. and, and that you've been you've been an explorer that that relationship with uh between community and spirituality is really really an interesting one um and and it seems that in a lot of your work you're relating sort of that sense of authenticity of self of being a seeker of identity with that mm -hmm. that whole concept of community building i wondered if you wanted to talk about that a little yeah. bit yeah i think that like once uh when i joined the um, a few years ago i joined this fellowship at on deck the founders on deck founders fellowship and i was writing hacking communities it was like october 2020 finishing up actually and one of the founders jumped in a call with me and asked me well why community building like why you're writing a book about community building and i shared like sorry for my friend because i'm not gonna say anything but also because i'm very bad at belonging that's what i told him and the reality is that like I don't think that for a very simple metaphor, I don't think you go outside of your place to buy an ice cream if you're not craving sugar. If you have already had a ton of sugar and cake, you will not go out and get an ice cream. So if you're really searching to learn about something, I believe it's because that's something you, one, that belongs to you, it's part of your inner self, but also that's something that you need to develop and grow into. I think that like, Community for me is about uh, people in transition. So in any community, either it's around a brand and product or service that you buy, you're talking about people who are trying to go from A to B. That could be a very spiritual journey. That could be a more pragmatic, simple journey of like, I'm solving a problem. But I find the deepest, usually most meaningful communities that are lifelong and they get people very involved are communities around life transitions you see how mother communities are very strong. I've been just experimenting that, like becoming a mom has been the most impressive community of back to primal community building I've ever experienced in the past years. So I think that community is a powerful tool for people going through transitions to find help in going from A to B. And in that same sense, becoming a community builder for me has been a journey from not belonging to belonging. And that's, uh, things, I think, such a very, such an important theme for people in general. And such it, it's such that Harry Potter, being one of the most highest gross selling books of our generation, uh, means that belonging matters because Harry Potter is a book about being a misfit and then finding belonging in a world of people who are like you. So I think that like, Community is a spiritual journey because it's basically a journey of transformation to becoming closer to who you are. And I think that becoming a community builder for me has been that journey because as I stated in my book, I've been through loneliness. I've experienced not belonging so many times in my life. 
And I've struggled with learning how to belong, not just for myself, but also creating that space for others. And um, to add another quick note, now I'm translating my book to Portuguese and I, I was just translating chapter four, where I talk about community being an act of like creating spaces where people can be authentic in the process of becoming better. So while we are all in community to be, go from A to B, the idea is that you create spaces where people feel safe and that they are already enough, they, that, that they can be authentic on the journey. And that's a hard thing to do. <laughs> so uh, I think that like, I can talk about it forever, but that's my take on community and say a more like spiritual journey. There, there's so many beautiful pieces in, in what you said there. And, and thanks for sharing your wisdom on that. The, um, where, where I definitely relate to that is um, I, I know um, in your book, you talk about the difference between sort of the cool kids community, the cool kids uh, space. Club, and, yeah. And cool kids club. Yes, thank you. And, and, yes. and the community. And, 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 and I, you know, people that have tuned into the show before will, will s smile at, indulgently at me as I, as I talk about, as I think about sort of the early concepts of community by de Torres um, in, uh, who, in German called, you know, made a distinction between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. Uh, mm. and Gemeinschaft is sort of that sense of belonging, that sense of connection, that there is an intimacy there, that there's, a, there's um, you know, there are some shared values in that space. Gesellschaft is exactly what you described as the the cool kids club um it's it's transactional it's distrustful it's based on yep. scarcity mindset um and and disconnection those are not places where it's safe to be your best self um yep. and and i and i particularly appreciated that and i also and i also liked the distinction you made um, because I, I i sometimes struggle with the notion of authenticity um mm. it's like we have a lot of authentic selves but I like the way that you characterized it as authenticity on the on a journey, um, that that mm -hmm. it is an opportunity to become. Because I feel like so many of the so many of the spaces we join, particularly in online spaces, but I think in, it applies to uh, in person, you know, kinds of uh, communities as well. It mm -hmm. feels like uh, there's an opportunity to experiment with self um, while when you're when you're in those places. If you if you feel like you have yeah. the psychological safety to explore elements of yourself that you would like to grow and develop. I think that's what you're describing maybe uh, around. Yeah. And I think that like the world more, like as I said, the online and um, the technology we have available today for the past 30 years, I would say, has been allowing us to do that type of experimentation in unprecedented ways. And for good and bad, I think that there are wonderful things that we are were able to do online. And mostly like if you look at Tumblr being like the birthplace of so many new identities around gender, for example, I think that they did a great job for the world in terms of allowing people to discover new ways of being that before did not exist, before still in the village. On the flip side, that also open space for some type of mob behavior, cancel culture and judgmental cultures that were based on like the extreme the extremism of those identities and i think that in every community there is a risk of that becoming i would say a cool kids club or a sort of uh cult when i mean cult i mean fanatism mm -hmm. and like dogmatic beliefs and i think that's uh on us to always remember that authenticity is about not forcing people to be a certain way in order for them to belong. Even if you think that your way of being is progressive, even if you think that your way of being is the righteous way, I think that like the internet also has open space, unfortunately, for an extremism of righteousness or even like whatever you believe as righteousness. So I think we are living in very interesting times where we are given the opportunity to reinvent belonging. In fact, the name of the Portuguese version of Hacking Community Group will actually be reinventing communities. And I'm sure that's going to be maybe maybe a title I'll republish in English because I feel there is some learnings I need to incorporate into a new book, <laughs> but that's another story. I just feel that like we have this opportunity, amazing opportunity, but at the same time, it's an enormous challenge to reinvent communities in a way that we create true belonging and allow people to go from A to B 
all around brands, around services, or around more individualistic um, self-growth journeys or whatever it is, we need to reinvent the way we interact and build the community in a way that I think makes people feel at home and that they are already enough while going from A to B and not making them feel that they are going to be canceled if they don't act according to the mob. Right. No, no matter what side of a political spectrum you fall in, if you feel like you have to fit into a viewpoint or a way of being, if you don't feel safe to be anything on the edges of or outside of that, that becomes that's a more rigid um, kind of kind of cultural context that it's, it's tough to become something there. It's tough to feel like you really belong. Yeah. If my if my belonging is contingent upon me having exactly the same mindset as you do, is that really healthy? Uh, you know, for me to to live in that kind of environment, I guess. Yeah, and and but at the bottom line, I feel that like I like to see the world right now as like we are going through a new opportunity, and I think on and to wrap up this idea, on one hand, we have technology, unprecedented ways to find new belonging, discover new ways of expressing ourselves. This is wonderful. We need to take advantage of that. On the other hand, we are the loneliest generation that has ever been. You can argue that this is because we have data on loneliness, which, which we didn't have maybe like 200 years ago. But I argue it's also because of the way the world has been restructured from us living in villages and small towns to living in like bigger cities and being behind a screen most of the time. So I think the world has been like reshuffled in the way it's organized. And on one hand, we have extreme freedom of expression. On the other hand, we lack the social integration of a village. On one hand, on the village, you had no freedom of expression, but you had that social integration that created that sense of safety. And right now, like, basically need to balance things out. I think we need to recreate belonging in a context where, like, I can express myself in whichever ways that feel the most authentic. And in the process of doing that, I have a community that embraces me, makes me feel socially integrated. That's a huge challenge. And I think that takes a ton of people, brands, companies, building communities there. And uh, can't talk about this forever, but... And, and we're all learning along the way. I, so I, I it, it kind of uh, sparked a thought for me. You, you and I had been talking offline a little bit about a, a book that I had, uh, had recommended mm -hmm. a lot to you called uh, Super Gods uh, by, uh, by yes. Grant Morrison. I'll, uh, I'll pop it up here on the screen here briefly. But um, th this one's Very a little recommended. bit. Recommended. Yeah, this this is a, a, a little bit of an abstruse read, but it's really about the history of comic books and storytelling and, and writing stories. One of the things that really powerfully stood out for me about the about the this particular book um, is um, Grant Morrison talking about like as a child growing up in Scotland after World War II uh, that uh, that he his parents were activists and they were terrified of the bomb you know and the, the mm. idea of the, the, the nuclear weapon and what for him gave him hope what uh, what what helped him to overcome those nightmares was the idea of Superman. You know, and that idea that Superman as an idea is more powerful than any bomb. And and I, I, I you know, I, I, I like to think in analogies a lot. Um, I think that uh, the idea of building communities in new ways is more powerful than loneliness um, that, mm. we're, that we're fighting right now. I think there's 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 tremendous opportunities um, for us. We're, we, you're right. We're absolutely reinventing that, right? Uh, and, uh, yeah. and 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 I love. Uh, I, I think like what stood out for me. You know, I've read a lot of books on community. What stood out for me about your work and what you were doing was that it it comes so much from the heart. Uh, what you do and that you are. I appreciate that. You were so vulnerable, and you yeah. you, you 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 brought so much of it to the surface, you know, in, in, in the discussion of that. It wasn't just the frameworks, as you rightly said, it's not just about frameworks. There has to be yes. something of your soul in it as well. Yeah. And I think that like, this is the thing, um, every community builder you speak with, they tend to share a language. Actually, that's what got me interested in community above it all, because suddenly I found myself belonging to a collective of mostly unnamed people, because most of them did not have titles with community in it at the time but who shared language. And I had been using metaphors for community thinking I had coined them until I met people across the ocean in San Francisco, I was living in Malaysia then, who literally mentioned things like engineering serendipity, community architect, or things that I used to name community were being used by people I had never met. And they probably invented that because when I Googled serendipity engineering, 
people were writing articles about that since 2007, whatever. So like even before. So when you talk about Superman or the super gods, what I like about it is because it talks about this kind of like idea of superheroes as archetypes. And if you think about, if you're a nerd, if you can think about Jungian archetypes, you can think about uh, the book of symbols, which I mentioned a lot in my own book about how superheroes and gods in the past and mythology and Joseph Campbell talked a lot about it in his book. And I actually like the, the hero of a thousand faces. And I also quoted a lot on hacking communities. It's how this shared symbology is strong for humans to the point that it's beneficial sometimes is actually also then dangerous because it could be dogmatic. But without diving too deep into this idea, I think that like the fact that we share minds with people just by being human is what I think community is. And when I wrote a book, I tried to use metaphors more than practical to do lists because I think that to the lists can be figured out based on your economy, context, cultural aspects, everything that you need to figure out for your community terminology. But what can't happen is that like you need to be a certain aligned with a certain set of values, a mindset that leads to community, not to cool kids clubs, for example. So I spent the first half of the book focused on like the core values of community, the mindset of a community builder. And I think on metaphors, like archetypes, like images that we all can relate with and that you can take home. So I hope that that has resonated with more people. And I know that like there are more practical books that are needed and they are out there. I meant to write part one focused on the fund foundations of community. And then part two, I talk a little bit about frameworks because I had those and they helped me. But I think that the mindset is more important. I, I think I think that that that's that's so insightful. And <clears throat> I mean, you, you made me think about as uh, as as you were discussing that sort of the um, when you know when when somebody's learning uh, martial arts uh, for the first time, um, you have them practice like a bunch of katas uh, or or just different moves at that until they like learn them in a very rote fashion, and then they get to the point where they have to sort of internalize them to get to that next level of learning. But I, I, I feel like there's there's a different way of approaching things as well, where you take on and, and, and really uh, address and understand, you know, why you're doing these things. And, and I think that kind of that that's almost a relation to Simon Sinek uh, getting to why uh, yeah. when, uh, you know, if you start with those motivations, if you start with with, you know, with what you're trying to achieve first, if you start with intention, then that's a, a more it's a it's a, a better way to get to success. You could maybe build a community if you know all of the frameworks and you and you can kind of follow a recipe, you know, to do it. But yeah. are, you, are you really going to create the social situation that you need to with it? Yeah. And I, and I think it's about like the longevity of your community and getting to the topic of like the practical stuff of, OK, designing community for contribution. Uh, you will hear from every community builder that is doing a great job out there and some of which I, I have actually interviewed to dive deeper into this idea of like building community for a contribution to activate user participation, to like leverage basically your clients as part of your value creation engine. And one of the people I interviewed is Christina Garnett from HubSpot. And she is a big voice on advocacy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have an issue pronounce that word. I would say a full description. <laughs> right, yeah. Great, thanks. <laughs> Perfect. And, uh, she is a big advocate on that and she explained that like you have to build authentic relationships and she is very big about like you have to understand where people are coming from and how they want to express love another example vivian weidler who spent like eight years building the community system the integrating community into the product development aspect of duolingo duolingo no everyone knows what duolingo is like a case of community building she shared how like people wanted to contribute they just had to enable them to. So people want to get the job done for you. If they place Clayton Christensen's idea of the job to be done, that like up with higher or fire products to do a certain job, depending on how well they develop, they deliver that job, we hire them again, or we fire them and get something else. In community, it's like you're getting your people to do that job, which is pretty much delivering your value proposition, right? And back to Duolingo, 
um, Vivian Weidler in conversation with me about to write that um, article that I'm now publishing on the CLI magazine, she's like, oh, people already wanted to contribute. We just had to create a system that carved the path to help them. For instance, she said people shared a sense of mission in democratizing language learning. They wanted to create, to allow other people to learn their language. And in a certain way, Duolingo is such a beautiful example because everybody is an expert in their own language. Even if a normal Joe, Jane in a specific city, they are oh, not an expert in anything, but I'm an expert in my native language. I can teach people how to speak Portuguese. And that gave people some sense of ownership, relevance, power that Duolingo allowed them to express. And it's beautiful because it's a shared sense of mission that later powers up a company worth, I forgot the number right now, but it's in the billions. And I think that harnessing that power starts from having a very foundational, very deeply rooted mission that can be shared and it's abundant enough to be shared globally. The more deeply rooted your mission is, the easier it would be for people to grasp on it and develop their own grassroots and develop it. And I think that when you start coming there from the end, you know, like the the golden hand or the like the shiny object of community is growth. So I find companies hiring community managers reading social media or reading word of mouth or reading advocacy program and reading ambassadorship. And how many times was I hired to do, run an ambassadorship program? And I was like, okay, we need to look first into operations and understand that building community is about first building the identity and the connectedness where identity is like people, who are the people and what's their purpose. Connectedness, it's what's the platform and what's the program that will bring them together recurring enough to build trust. And ultimately identity plus connectedness lead to growth, which could be people contributing to value creation or, and that could become like people, your referral program, that's how they contribute. Or it could be them literally creating parts of our pro or your product like Duolingo or it could be people improving your product and helping you accelerate your operation, how can I say, streamlining your time to deliver, like ways using community to optimize the identification of bugs faster than the internal team could. Whatever you call contribution, community in business needs to be aligned with the creation of value and should be, if you think about the business model canvas, both in the right side and the left side of your canvas. It's in the growth, but growth results from including people in the operational aspects of your business. Mm -hmm. And I know we can, I will, I'll give it back to you. So let me know if I'm making sense or what questions that could direct this idea a little bit more into practice. But I think then I show back to the beginning, purpose is the foundation of why people will continue to contribute. And that's important that people sometimes go directly to the growth part and miss it. I think that's an incredible uh, insight and, and and one that I, I, I think personally resonates with me uh, in any of the consultancy work that I've done uh, with, with, with uh, particularly with enterprise organizations where sometimes I, I think often in the, in, in the most well-meaning way, uh, you'll have uh, a leadership team or champions of the, of the community program want to build a growth program. They want engagement, they want growth, they haven't necessarily defined what that means in their heads yet. Oh my God, and, engagement. And, or engagement, yeah. And, <laughs> like and the they, word. Yeah, what kind of engagement are you talking about, right? That's that's always the question. But um, when, when it becomes time to, you know, like uh, when, I, when I'm talking to organizations, a lot of times it's sort of like asking questions that kind of poke here, does it hurt when I do this? Does it hurt when I do that? And and when when asking about sort of like, well, what do you think people want, you know, from, from your organization? like. How is it that they relate to you? Like, how close is it to their being? How intimate is what you're doing um, to to their lives, to their personal identities? You know, to what to what they're doing. And if I if I get sort of statements about like, well, you know, we've done all the persona work, we know all, all that. Um, I'm almost immediately skeptical uh, a lot of the time because it, you know, yeah. I want to ask further, like, how how much have you talked to to individuals? How many people have you talked to? about this, how, how deeply or qualitatively you talk to them. Because a lot of times if it's just a survey, you're not gonna get at the heart of what people want because you're still framing questions that you your want. Your assumptions. To, yeah, you're making some assumptions based, you know, uh, and your questions are reflecting your assumptions. Yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know who told me this recently. It might have been actually Christina Garnett in the conversation we had because she was the one telling, telling talking about uh, how they use data to identify how people want to demonstrate their love. So I'll risk in saying that it was her. But basically, like, you need to look at behavior more than what people claim to be and how they okay. tie themselves. When you talk about, like, uh, top contribution, when you want to give people a badge, it should not be related to, well, this is obvious, but, like, I, I think that sometimes companies don't understand that, should not be related to their position, to their predetermined, like, identities. It should be related to their behavior in the community and how much that behavior is aligned with the creation of value in line with what you define as value in your value proposition. So I think that like the problem of that is that I think many companies don't measure well the journey for customer success. In fact, if I would choose, if you force me to choose one thing that I think community is closest to in terms of a department in a company, I would say it's customer success, even though oftentimes they think of customer success mo mostly for SaaS B2B companies. Mm -hmm. But I think customer success is about literally people being successful in achieving whatever they wanted when they joined your company, right? And the point of community is how do you, instead of like making your team make and bake the pizza, how can you open the kitchen so that people can always come and contribute and add their flavor to it? So how can you open the doors? So that requires extreme vulnerability and that requires extreme diligence. Diligence? Is that it? Yeah. To like measure and track data from the moment they are new customers to the moment they become top contributors so that you understand which steps are they taking that identify meaningful contribution and that would cause them to level up. And again, another concept that is helpful here is the idea of user contribution journey. It is a framework that you can find it shaped in multiple ways. The way I see it is about having simple, quantifiable, measurable steps, observable behaviors that people can take that lead to the value creation that you're talking about. And the more they contribute, the more they mean they are committed, the more they grow intimate to you. Mm -hmm. And the more intimate they are, the more you communicate with them. So bottom line is building this journey is about building also a communication systems that enables, that allows your top contributors to feel closer to home, highly valued, the more they contribute. Waze is a great example on how they do it. No coincidence that the head of global communities at Waze, Hilla Roth, is a data scientist by training. So. I like to joke that like the best community builders are there are highly empathetic systems thinkers, system thinkers, or highly analytical people. And we are often thought of as like highly extroverted people who are going to host events and talk to people on social media. I think that the best community builders are actually highly analytical system thinkers who like to create systems to scale intimacy. And that's about communication systems, that's about tracking data, that's about defining what contribution is. Community needs to be at the core of the business or you're gonna find it as an accessory, as a feature, as a cute strategy, like a forum for Q and A where people help each other troubleshoot. Eventually it's gonna be irrelevant. You're gonna lay off your community team because you never saw results. If that sounds familiar, it's because many people have been reading the community wrong. So if anything, community is customer success or should lead to customer success, putting the customer in the as a protagonist, not as the audience. I, I love that point of view. Um, so uh, let me let me pause a little bit here and uh, put a couple of uh, voices from the uh, from from the chat uh, up up in the window here, so just to see if there's some some areas that we we want to uh, want to comment on. Um, just a couple of quick uh, things. A uh, shout out to you from uh, from Kelly Pratt, who says, "I love your five P structure: people, purpose, participation, programming, yeah. platform." Um, great to great to see you on this on the stream, Kelly. Uh, hello. Thank you, Kelly. Um, uh, we've got uh, Luaducci. Lu Lu I'll give a call out uh, to as well as uh, as well as Nicholas uh, Gote. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicholas, for the, for the troubleshoot there. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So earlier on, John Summers, hi John, uh, said you can apply the same concept for oh, yeah. communities. Users that are in the process of changing software and adopting new tools get extreme value from the community in the core use case. Yeah. yeah. 
I think that B two B are like they they I don't know because B two B communities also tend to be um, almost automatically highly relatable because they tend to be within a niche. Mm -hmm. They are very powerful, and uh, if you think of the one, some of the first community cases for business like Salesforce, it's powerful because you I mean it's easier not easier but like it's more it's more clearly seen that if your value proposition is helping people do better business aka sell more make more money it's easier to think about how can other business development sales professionals or businesses that are trying to achieve the same goals help each other in improving their tactics which are not just related to software it's also related to like um skills or it's related to networks so I think that like I've built my business in B2B back then in Malaysia. And I think those are some of the most powerful communities, but also hard to crack into building vulnerability between businesses. But it's very interesting to build communities within like a B2B concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've done a fair amount in the B2B space. And, and I, I think that's that's absolutely spot on uh, your, your observation. Um, some other some other folks here. So Marcia says a space that inspires and supports members being their authentic self is a great measure for success of, for a community. Um, that's great. I, I'll often talk about that as sort of an assumption of benevolence of others in the space. Um, if I if I have that sense of safety, then uh, then I can kind of be who I am or or experiment with who I am a little bit. And also, if I can just like uh, try to bring like our feet to the ground on that concept, because I know that it can be sometimes very like vague to think about safe spaces. And we hear safe spaces often like too much and like it's not very clear. I gave an example in my book, which is about a pole dancing school in San Francisco, <laughs> which is right. I think very practical. And I think that like, um, if you think, try to bring it, this metaphor to your business, but basically like in which way people are vulnerable when they are using your product, in which way they feel they might not be enough or they might not be seen by people they don't want to be seen by people outside uh their product and in which way they can relate to other people as if they are there in community because they all have the same problem they want to solve but not necessarily they feel like great about having to find that type of solution they maybe wish they would have solved that on their own or they maybe still think they can i don't know in which ways you can relate to that thought but basically back to the pole dancing school i remember like um if you have never been to a pole dancing school, just imagine like a bunch of people on their underwear trying to do movements and stretches and feeling completely not capable of doing that because they are all regular people trying to learn. And imagine that suddenly someone fully dressed of enters that room with intentions that are not the same as yours, with predatorial intentions, specifically a guy. Once I was in class, entered the pole dancing class, the school, while the owner was actually teaching a class. And I was in the class. This woman just lived, stood up on her like seven inch heels and stormed this man out of the school, said, you'd never come back here again. I'll call the police. You have been, anyways, it doesn't matter. It was a case of borderline um, harassment of someone in the school threatening the very foundation of what brought people that, to that space, which was a safe space. And her reaction and what I'm saying should be the reaction of any great community manager, community builder was to immediately stand up against it, even though that couldn't that could pose a risk for her, even though maybe she could have reacted in a different way. I think that like when there is anything that threatens the sense of safety within our community, it could be a troll, could be a glitch, could be a data privacy breach, could be anything. I think your role should stand up, be vulnerable and transparently in front of your community, defend the very space that you need to keep safe. And I think that oftentimes the way we do it is by acknowledging if there's a glitch, acknowledging if there's a breach and bringing people together and making them feel that like you will stand up for them and you'll hold that space safe. Another example I can give that maybe like this one's a little bit far off from so from startups, uh, pole dancing school, is in my first, um, one of my first startup jobs, I was director of marketing and communications, AKA community, but that didn't exist as a role before yet in a uh, Argentinian company. And we're organizing um, the first 100% online conference that was back in 2013. And we had like 85 speakers from all Latin America and we had a very ambitious agenda. And back then Zoom did not exist. 
So let's say that we had like three speakers speaking at the same window of time for a full week from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. The first speakers say scheduled from 9 to 10 were speaking the same platform and we had like 5,000 people live at the same time and it failed. Like we, we broke the internet, we broke the platform because it was not built for that at the time. People were wanting their money back. They were yelling at us. They created a Facebook group to be like against us. And I remember being up with the founders until 5 a.m. trying to solve the problem. But the first thing we did is like convince the founders who were actually very mad at the users who were um, against them, who were like complaining, who wanted their money back. I convinced the founders that these people were the ones who cared about the product the most. And we needed to apologize to them and tell them that we're solving it. Please bear with us. We released a letter acknowledging that we failed, acknowledging that we did not consider this happening, and acknowledging that it was on us. Please give us one day to figure this out. Hmm? And we did. And the same people who were insulting us <laughs> yeah. started commenting in support and stayed on. We broke down the conference in three weeks instead of one week so that we're no more like talked at the same time. And that's how we solved it. My bo the bottom line is like, you have to be vulnerable. And oftentimes the way to keep a safe space is by acknowledging people's feelings, taking the blame. And in the corporate world, it's a thing. People don't usually apologize because it's a liability issue. And I think that's against the idea of authenticity and vulnerability that build safe spaces. I may have gone too long of a way there, but I hope that gives more ground into like what safe spaces mean. And it oftentimes means being vulnerable in front of your users. No, I, I think that those are those are amazing examples and uh, and really helpful for people that are thinking about, uh, you know, how, how you build that sense of safety in, uh, you know, to to any of the online experiences that you're created, uh, you create in, in particular. But I, I love that that sense of uh, the, the ferocious protection of the, the, the pole dancer class was, uh, <laughs> was, was a perfect example, too. Um, yeah. You know, in, in, in practical terms of, of the platforms that we're running, um, that to me has always been a couple of things. Um, one has been sort of establishing the purpose for given spaces. So having some circles where we've defined this as a particular kind of safe space, maybe even within the broader community, you've got a protected group um, where they need to, to be maybe closed off from, from the rest so that they can kind of have their conversations about whatever, whatever that topic is. Um, but I think even as you said, you know, just ensuring that there's transparency about like, what is this space for? And that assurance that as a community manager, somebody that's, that's helping to facilitate that space, that you'll be backed up, you know, if, uh, yeah. if someone has violated the, the norms of, of that space as well. And also I wanted to like, sorry, switch topic. I know that we're eventually running out of time and there's a question from Mark Gargola. Oh. I don't know if I'm answering, pronouncing your name correctly on could we hear a tangible example of oh, scaling oh, into a oh, oh, that's, that's the right one. You got the right, the right one. Right. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. There we go. Yeah. yeah. So um, we talked about this before and I always like to go to the tangible examples whenever possible. And I think that like there's two I would suggest that you dive deeper into and I'm going to briefly mention them here. One is ways and um, I don't know, it, I've been more using Google Maps recently, but I, I've used Waze a ton in my past life. And I think the way they designed community for to for scale is amazing. And again, Hila Roth is a data scientist, is their global head of community, and she was very intentional about this. So first of all, uh, she has a very large team. She was the only one and grew her team into over 50 people. And the way they operate in a business uh, why is way is that they have a squad methodology. So basically the community teams OKRs are basically the other teams OKRs and they are present in every other team meeting and trying to find a way how to power up their own missions. So they are distributed team. I often think that like way is a very specific example because community is fundamental to their product. Like they have their community of editors. They have their community of beta testers. They have the community of, um, there's another one that I'm forgetting right now, but they have different types of communities. And within each of these communities, they have multiple levels of contribution. And through data, they are able to identify how much people are supporting 
the mission of that team, supporting the mission of the company or the achievement of their OKRs. And not only they have different bubbles of supporters, so basically they organized, okay, so we have beta testers and for example, and editors. So those are different committees, and they have the local champions, sorry, they have the local champions who are basically like organizers in their local ecosystems of editors, etc. And each of these different bubbles have their own missions. So that's a way to say like you have a million users. So first you break them into buckets on how they want to contribute. Christina Garnett says something similar. You basically try to identify true behavior and data. Where are people going? And you sort of organize them into buckets. That might take time because you need to observe them for a little bit. And mm -hmm. that's to a certain level bottoms up and top down because one, you have your product and the needs of your product as in, in ways you need people to edit maps and you need people to uh, beta test. So these are top down contributions. Then there's bottoms up, things that people just want to do. They want to wear your t-shirt. They want to refer your product to a friend. That, so that's, those are things that are identified from data. Whatever it is, you understand those buckets and you carve paths for people to enter in those. And you need to understand levels of contribution, like video games, pretty much, within each of these uh, buckets. So for instance, how do you communicate with someone who is a top contributor versus someone who just joined? in and is starting to edit maps. How do you help top contributors help the new ones? In a nutshell, how do you design that journey so that you help new users become a contributor and then from new contributors to become a top contributor and basically you break this down in several groups. You create a little ecosystem, if you wanna say, or a little, or a little constellation of people based on how they're contributing, that's a bucket. And within that, what is the journey? And that sounds complicated, my suggestion is that you think about three and three, maybe every company would have three levels of contribution, three areas, sorry, of contribution. And within three, each area of contribution, there's three areas of like growth that they can go through from new to top contributor. And that's um, in more architecturally speaking, how to scale intimacy. I hope that's not too like vague, Mark. And ultimately, I think that like, you need to think of how to not centralize communication and to that platform and programming are fundamental because those buckets help you make sure that you are not creating a room like hosting 15 people in a football stadium or feeding a thousand people in your dinner room in your, in your dining room i like creating intimacy means breaking people down into smaller bubbles or smaller communities and smaller type of events because that allows people to develop relationships differently so if you think about it on events on an events perspective, always think about hosting at least three different types of events, hosting coffee chats, which are like one to three people, host dinners, which is like eight to 15 people or less, and meetups, which are like 40 people, 50 people in a room. And then you can have music festivals. So, you know, some once in a while, like conference, like CMX Summit, like CLI Summit, etc. cetera, because, um, those are different ways in which people interact at different levels of intimacy. And this type of events force serendipity in different ways. Um, but I'm always like, I just like things that are easy to memorize. So think about the threes, always the rule of threes about organizing people in at least three areas of expertise or contribution, creating three levels of at least progression in the community and always think about creating events that progress according to their contribution. Thinking of the idea of coffee, dinner, and party, or eventually a music festival. I hope I did not go too long into this. No, no, no. That, that, that's that's absolutely golden. I, I yeah. first of all, I, I I love the idea of sort of conceiving of things in threes because psychologically speaking, that's like how people tend to think in in threes. I love the gamification element of that. Sort of thinking about what is that growth pattern? Like how you know how do we see how people kind of grow go from level to level. Um, and, yeah. and I think it, it, it speaks to, in, in practical ways, um, what, you what you talk about in the book in terms of collision theory of people and just oh, yeah. like, how do we create more of those kinds of uh, ways for people to know? And, and that idea of having like three different levels of events is amazing. That's a, that's a terrific insight um, because you're yeah. creating different social situations with different levels of intimacy that, um, I, that that's such a powerful idea and, and such a nice, such a nice way to, uh, Kind of wrap exactly. up here, uh, you know, for and a conversation. We, and you know, we can dive deeper into each of these strategies. I always try to like show too much content in one because I think there's different ideas that can be useful for different people. 
And I think the most important, like when I talk about collision theory, I legitimately think we work that way. Like think of frequency, whatever you do event wise, think of like making that cadence work. The founder of Startup Grind, Derek Anderson, is one of the most like natural community builders I've met. He wrote the foreword for my book and he's like, he's been a big teacher for me in community building. I worked with Startup Grind for years and he's like, always said a secret recipe for startup brand success has been cadence and simplicity. So frequency is everything. Density, which is the relevance of people in the room. When, people, when I say density, people think about, oh, small cozy spaces. Yes, and relevance. How do you create curate the room? How there is density in sense of like conversations that they can have, which are deep. And finally, uh, catalyzing effects. Catalyzers could be a facilitator you know, the table, could be a discussion topic, could be your agenda. Anything that serves as a catalyst, conversation starters could be a catalyst. So I think that we work like particles just like that sometimes. And when you think of those three levels of events, always think of frequency, density, and catalysts to optimize interactions and lead to successful reactions more often. That's fantastic. Yeah, Mark liked your examples, so. <laughs> That's great, thanks. <laughs> Um, so, so uh, I, I can't believe how fast uh, the, the time has gone by here with us. But uh, so grateful for you taking time and for explaining and and giving examples of uh, a lot of your thinking about community building. Um, can we maybe wrap up with uh, tell me a little bit about sort of what you're excited about right now? What are you planning next? Is there any kind of upcoming events that you're going to be at? Yeah. Um, and anything that's <laughs> on your mind. I need to just share one thing that I'm seeing going on in the chat before I go, because there, uh, Mark is talking about theater and everybody's going wild about it. And I need to say that like I've done clown work, clown workshops before, which has a lot to do with improv, uh, back in like the age many years ago. And I love the concept of clown or clownship, if that exists as a word, applied to community, because like when you are a clown, and I think it's the same with improv, maybe or maybe it's just, you don't have the fourth wall. If you guys know the fourth wall of theater is where like, if I'm playing Hamlet, I'm in Hamlet's world. I'm in Denmark, there's no fourth, there's like there's fourth wall that separates me from the audience. That's traditional marketing, right? Traditional business. I have an ad, I put it in the magazine and you see my brand as I believe it is. Community is when you break the fourth wall and the principles to being a clown and a good one is that if a dog barks, in the audience, you have to relate to that. You have to interact with that. You have to play with if someone sneezes, if you trip, if you lose your line. So breaking that fourth wall, AKA like being vulnerable and being yourself and interacting with the present is key to community building as a strategy. And I think it's very relatable to like theater. And um, anyway, thank you for bringing that, that up. And that's what I'm working on. Do you have anything to say, Todd? Uh, no, I, I I love that. I I think it's amazing. I I, I was smiling because uh, we our, our last session that we did on talk about your community was Amadou Diallo, a friend of mine, who we were just talking about uh, using improv and storytelling techniques for community. Oh my God, yeah. So it fits very nicely. Yeah. If if, you, if anyone has happened to miss that show, it's on it's on our YouTube channel for Clock Tower Advisors. Um, Amadou and I have a great time, and he's on he's on today's stream too here. So that was that's cool. Yeah. That's uh, amazing. I mean, yeah. So anyways, I'm currently translating hacking communities uh, into Portuguese to publish it in Brazil and Portugal. So starting to speak about community in Portuguese, eventually I want to translate it to Spanish too. Uh, I plan to start sharing more about all the things that I've discussed today in my native language, but also in Spanish because I lived there in Argentina, Chile for a while and can relate highly to the Spanish speaking community. And I think that there's a lack of conversations in those languages. So anyone you know who'd like to join, do let me know. And I'm actually looking for people to maybe pre-read the chapters in Portuguese and help me with that. So launching this in us uh, as a rain as I retitled it to reinventing communities in 2024. And lots of cringe moments reading my own book by the way. Uh big advice to not self-publish to anyone who's writing a book. But if you do um let me give you some advice but like I'm thinking of actually rewriting many pieces of hacking communities into a new edition soon or just writing another book. Other than that, I'm actually uh, looking to help people. So if you know anyone looking for consulting who gets it, 
and wants to work flexibly or fractionally with someone in building community strategy, let me know. I have a five month old right now who's my main boss and he's very bossy, <laughs> very demanding, but I'm looking forward to just working with people in that way and building a community for moms and dads actually who work fractionally and remote and want to keep advancing their careers because the VC and startup world is not built for mothers. And I've built communities for startups before and I'm pretty much redoing what, all I did, but now for people who are founders and parents and want to have their kids around. So I'm doing that, a lot of stuff, but uh, reach out if you can relate to anything. And thank you so much for having me, Todd. Lisa, uh, I will continue to follow your adventures uh, with, with great interest. Um, I, 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 I treasure knowing you and, uh, and, and I really appreciate uh, the wisdom that you brought to, to the conversation today and everything you shared with everyone in the audience. If anyone uh, has not already read it, I encourage you to go out and, uh, and get Hacking Communities. It's a, it's a great read. It is a unique and valuable contribution to the community building space. And uh, Lisa, I, I hope you come back again and tell us more about your, your latest things that you're working on because uh, it is endlessly fascinating to, to hear what's on your mind and how you're thinking about uh, the world of community building today. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me, Todd. It's been fun and definitely hope to be back as well. And thank you everyone for being here. Good to see yes. familiar faces. Yes, th th thanks everybody for tuning in. Appreciate all the comments. We'll try to respond to everybody. And in the meantime, uh, take some time for yourself this weekend. Be good to yourself because if you're not good to yourself, uh, you're not going to be any good to anyone else. Um, we will be back here in two weeks, uh, October the 13th, with uh, Matthew Armstrong from Recur, uh, who is a Community Executive Nominee of the Year for CMX. Uh, maybe by the time he's back, we'll know if he got that, uh, that award. Uh, but we're going to be talking a little bit about building and running Web3 communities. So uh, look for an announcement of that uh, up on uh, the, the Clock Tower Advisors uh, LinkedIn company page. Uh, and of course, uh, please follow, comment, share, uh, if you will, um, and subscribe to the, uh, the Clock Tower Advisors YouTube channel uh, if you get a chance. We'll be back again uh, in just two weeks. In the meantime, have a great rest of the day. We'll see you soon. Thank you.